Coming to you from a secret discotheque speak... Motherfucker. Coming to you from a secret discotheque speakeasy in the sewers of New Jersey, it's the Troma Now Podcast. I'm honored to be sitting here in the Long Island City offices with the creator of Troma, the longest running independent film label in the United States and likely the world. He played my grandfather in an homage to Silent Night, Deadly Night in the comedy Caesar and Otto's Deadly Xmas. So say hello to the father of modern independent cinema, the creator of iconic characters galore, the Stan Lee of exploitation cinema, Mr. Lloyd Kaufman. Hello. Now, right off the bat, Return to Newcomb High is now premiering all across the U.S., so I want to give us, because I know this is first and foremost on your mind. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, what's your name again? No, I'm just kidding. I know your <laughs> name very, very well, Mr. Canfield. Um, we open in L.A. March 8th at the uh, Aria Lemley Fine Arts and then uh, whatever it is, some NoHo, Lemley NoHo, North Hollywood. And there's a museum and a, a party. And uh, go to the Troma websites, troma.com or my fan site, lloydkaufman.com. And you can find out all the free events. It's going to be a whole pageant. March 8th through the 13th, there's many different events that are going to be supporting the uh, wonderful re Return to Return to Nukemai, a.k.a. Volume 2. Was this planned at one point just to be a single sequel and it just got, it was so big that it became two sequels? I mean, how did it wind up as a return to and then return to return to Nukemai? A long time ago, I was at a film festival with Quentin, what's that guy, the guy who tied up... Uh, Uma Thurman and crashed her car. What's his name? Tarantino. Tarantino. Yeah. And um, b uh, this was probably before he uh, tried to kill, uh, what's her name? Bill. Uh, and uh, kill Bill, yeah. Uh, at any rate, he told me to make something more e uh, eventful, more ambitious, and even though we have a low budget. Uh, and uh, so I uh, did that. I figured we'll do a two part uh, uh, movie, and, uh, Return to Newcomb High, Volume 1, which was. Uh, uh, premiered at the Museum of Modern Art along with Spielberg's new movie and Scorsese's new movie and, and Sofia uh, Coppola's new movie and blah, blah, blah. And now the uh, volume two has had a huge uh, day at the Museum of the Moving Image. And after that, uh, many movie theaters have been begging to play Return to Return to Nukemai, a.k.a. volume two. But that is actually not true. Uh, in spite of that, uh, very few uh, theaters have called up because they're all under the thumb of the evil conglomerate, uh, the evil uh, Mur Rupert Murdoch's and the evil devil-worshipping international media conglomerate. So if you Troma fans out there want to see Return to, Return to Nukemai, a.k.a. Volume 2 on a big screen, contact David Camfield uh, or contact me. Contact at Lloyd Kaufman on Twitter. And uh, at Lloyd Kaufman uh, on uh, Facebook or uh, fan site, LloydKaufman.com. And uh, I'll be there. I'll be there. You know, I, I hear uh, Joe Randazzo and company uh, in Chicago are in the process of getting into the theaters there as well. So it's going to be all across the U.S., I'm assuming. Yes. Uh, if, if, uh, if, if I direct a movie, we can usually get about 200 uh, movie theaters, one by one by one by one. We can't open the way... Uh, What's that movie by uh, that opened today? Something to do with a uh, with Black Cat? Is that a new movie? It's uh, a low budget film. I think oh. they did it for forty thousand dollars. Uh huh. Well, whatever it is, it opened this weekend and apparently did very well. We can't support uh, five thousand movie theaters uh, all at once, so we have to go. And no, nor could we get uh, in New York. We can only get one theater if we're lucky. And in Los Angeles, we got two screens and blah blah blah. So uh, the fans need to go to their local movie theater and tell the movie theater, we want the Troma movie. And you, because the movie theaters never call Uncle Lloyd back. So uh, go to your local theater. That, and we make our movies for the big screen, as David Camfield knows. Uh, and the uh, fans of Troma enjoy a communal uh, sec. I mean, they enjoy the communal uh, movie watching. Uh, so go to your movie theater and tell them you... And then in some cases, I can go there. I go to L.A., about Los Angeles, about once a month. So, uh, you know, I'm going to stop off in uh, Chicago. There's a bidding war, thanks to, uh, to Joe uh, Rentezzo. There's a bidding war going on in Chicago right now. As soon as we figure out what theater is going to play Return to Return to Newcomb High, a.k.a. Volume 2, uh, I'll set up... Uh, I'll go there on my way to L.A., and uh, we'll have a big weekend of, of trauma.
So I want to go back to the beginning before you ever went to Yale, before you were a filmmaker. What kind of movies were you as a kid watching? What kind of films did you love? That's a very good question, David. I really didn't go to the cinema very much. Uh, the only time I went, I think, was birthday parties, either mine or uh, people like Oliver Stone, who went to second grade with me. And we'd, uh, that was, so we only got to see, at least I only got to see movies like Billy Wilder's The Spirit of St. Louis at Radio City Music Hall, or uh, I remember as a, a, a young child, my mother took me to see uh, Bambi, uh, and uh, it scared the crap out of me. And I, I didn't really respect movies because uh, my mother was sort of a theater person, and I was raised uh, going to see a lot of Broadway shows and off-Broadway shows, uh, uh, thing, uh, plays by... Uh, by uh, Ionesco and, um, and Terence McNally, uh, and uh, obviously I loved all the musicals. Being a gay married man, I've cried through just about every Judy Garland or Barbara Streisand uh, show. So um, that was uh, pretty much until I went to Yale and happened to get a room, uh, um, stuck in a room with a movie nut who ran the Yale Film Society. Our beds were head to toe, very small bedroom, and at night I would inhale his... Uh, Godard's stinking feet and the aroma du trauma started permeating uh, my uh, brain since I hadn't played football in college. I didn't have concussion and I won't die prematurely like these poor uh, football players. So um, I still remember that, that uh, thanks to Yale I got uh, hooked on uh, movies because my roommate was head of the Yale Film Society and I'd drift in to see uh, different movies and they were into the auteur theory of uh, directing, namely that the director is the boss, the total uh, dictator of the movie, and um, I started getting uh, blown away by uh, Chaplin, and I didn't even know there was a thing of it. I didn't even know there was such a thing as a director when I went to college. I didn't know that, I had no, I never thought about uh, how a movie got made. Uh, I just remember when Michael Todd uh, crashed, uh, Elizabeth Taylor's wife, who uh, produced uh, Around the World in 80 Days. I remember when his plane crashed and he died. I remember uh, Oliver Stone it was like third grade or something. He was like, he was so shocked. And I, and I, you know, I didn't give a shit. I, you know, I just didn't understand that there was such a thing as a movie director or producer or any of that. Didn't care. But then I started watching the Yale Film Society movies and there's Chaplin. And he not only acted, he wasn't just a goofy clown. He was a thought-provoking uh, philosopher and movie director and m music writer and script writer. He was a filmmaker. And based on the French uh, Cahier de Cinema, since I'm a very uh, well-educated bourgeois, uh, I speak French and I could read all those uh, Cahier de Cinema, which was the magazine stacked up in the office of the Yale Film Society, which came from the Cinémathèque Française. And I would read these articles by Chabrol and Godard and the... Uh, the film noir and uh, people of the uh, the Nouvelle Vague, uh, people of the French uh, 50s and 60s, who were transitioning into becoming women. No, they were transitioning into becoming uh, movie makers, and um, unlike uh, what's going on today. And they uh, they had fucked up my life because I bought into the auteur theory of filmmaking, and that's eventually led to my decision to stay in New York and... Uh, live in the uh, underground, which meant I had to live in the uh, in a refrigerator box under the underpass and beg for whatever it is. Something to do with soap or soap something. something. What bath is salts? It? Yeah, bath salts, <laughs> that's it. It's not easy to come by these days. At any rate, uh, it was all due to Yale and Robert Edelstein who ran the Yale Film Society and, and uh, it fucked up my life. Well, Maybe I'm stating the obvious, but your producing partner and from a, a co-president, Michael Hurst, was your uh, roommate in college? Or what, did he lead you down the path and you found Michael Hurst? No, Michael did everything he could to avoid me in college. In fact, he still tries to avoid me, uh, unsuccessfully, may I say. He, um, he is much younger than I, and much more attractive, and should be the front man here. But um, uh, he does not like to appear in public. Uh, in fact, he prefer that uh, somebody else appear here in Troma, probably. He needed a television. I had a TV at Yale. I had a black and white, one of those TVs that you have to smash the top of to make the picture start uh, drifting upward. Uh, and he wanted to watch TV, so he had to sort of talk to me and watch TV. After I graduated and started uh, making unsuccessful movies, Michael went to law school, and one day his wife took him to see Cry Uncle, 
um, just by accident. It was a uh, it, it was a, a John Avelson very low budget movie, John G. Avelson, and uh, it was shot after Joe. But uh, in those days, if you had an independent movie with a little something to it, you could get fifty theaters. And Cry Uncle opened uh, with fifty or sixty movie theaters. It was an X rated movie. It's a brilliantly funny uh, uh, parody of the film noir. Uh, and Nouvelle Vague detective, you know, cry uncle, cry terror, cry whatever, cry, uh, cry, uh, whatever. You know, you know the uh, the old, uh, how do you call it? Film noir, yeah, film noirs. And um, it's a wonderful film. Uh, but uh, Maris took her mother to see it. Uh, Maris, Michael's wife, uh, uh, putting a th- showing mother the ad from the New York Times, which was full page, by the way, if I remember correctly. She put her. Uh, um, um, I was involved in producing that movie. Uh, you know, and uh, I put uh, she Maris put her thumb over the X rating part of the ad, and they went to see it, her mother and she, and uh, apparently liked it. And then at the end, I had a big credit, and um, and Michael didn't want to be a lawyer, so uh, Maris suggested he contact me, which was a huge kids, mistake on his part. How did two kids out of Yale wind up forming this film production company? Out of just uh, the American dream, you know, uh, it's the greatest country in the world, and. We bought into that, uh, that magic. Uh, Warren Buffett says you win uh, the lottery by being born in a, in America. And Jimmy Buffett, of course, uh, made a noise like a frog. He was dead. He didn't say anything. Other than, yeah, he croaked. Crouch. Yeah, yeah. Yes, let me ask you this. So you knew Oliver Stone, and when he was in, like when you were in second grade, how does he wind up two decades plus later appearing in a Trump? Uh, being how does Oliver Stone winding up being a totally successful and me being a Failed uh, underground, See, that, bitter, that's, that's, that's bitter really old, idea. drunken, drugged up uh, uh, Everybody filmmaker. Everybody knows Lloyd Kaufman. Yeah, no, they so don't. Very hard I mean, on they don't. Well, I'll put it this way: a, a great. Well, you're being people. very nice. I've, I've, I've forced you to say good things about me, <laughs> and you're a good guy, and you're very articulate too. And I very much like your podcast. It's very good, and I hope you get good audience because you deserve it. You're doing a very good job. Now, um, uh, Oliver Stone, we just happened to be in second grade together at Trinity School in New York. Uh, by the way, uh, Trinity School, I think, is one of the highest paid uh, principals uh, in the world, uh, which is kind of disgusting. Uh, it wasn't like that when I was a kid. It was uh, uh, kind of a uh, middle class, l- lower middle class type of place. And um, they were, uh, I had a very good education. But Oliver was in second grade. Our parents became very, very close. And um, in fact, my father gave a, gave a small uh, scholarship of some sort to Trinity School in the name of Oliver, Oliver Stone's dead father. And they were kind of best friends. And my mother and her, his mother were buddies. So we spent a lot of time together until Oliver got successful. Uh, we were cl- quite tight. We lived close to each other uh, in New York. And we went to camp together and a lot of uh, events together. And and uh, when I got out of college, um, no, actually, when I was at Yale, I was making movies. And Oliver was writing a very shitty uh, novel. He was trying to be James Joyce. And uh, my father and I read it, and it was absolute garbage. And uh, then I was making movies, and Oliver would sort of hang out with us. And uh, I made Battle of Love's Return right after college. And uh, Oliver was nice enough to work on that and to play a small part in it. You can see him acting. Uh, and... Uh, now, you can also see in that little cameo that he's a damn good actor. And um, then uh, we did some more. We, he and I, he was one of the producers on Sugar Cookies, which was our version of a lesbianic uh, vertigo, Hitchcock's vertigo. Uh, you can see we were in on the LGBT before it became flavor of the day and, and uh, so precious to the politically correct. Um, and then he, um, we did some other stuff. But um, at, at, at he wanted to make a company together, but uh, he didn't really. He, he's kind of psycho, so uh, Trauma I, I didn't. Have been, uh, 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 Oliver Stone joint along. Yeah, but I would have been like a beaten dog, uh, you know. He, 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 the, the guy is. Uh, I don't think it's a lot of fun to be with him. At least it wasn't. Uh, and uh, in any event, uh, he's got more Oscars than uh, he's got to have his his mantelpiece reconditioned so he can put all those Oscars on it. And meanwhile, I'm uh, I'm playing the part of Willie Loman here, and uh, probably will end up the same way. Lloyd is a legend. So now, but I'm responsible for Oliver Stone becoming a filmmaker, without a doubt. He never th- he never even thought about filmmaking. 
Did you right? guys? Did you guys like? Um, in fact, he was very right wing in those days. But uh, this podcast is about a certain narcissist that you're talking to, not about Oliver Stone's. <laughs> Fuck him. And plus, the fact, what a ass licker with Putin. I, I mean, really, I was so disappointed because he's not an ass licker, and he's there in the. That thing with Putin, he was just like a little puppy. I, I was shocked, honestly. So we're, we're talking in fact, I think Oliver Trump. Stone. I think Oliver Stone interfered with the. I don't think it was the Russians. I think he interfered with the uh, American elections. Lock well, up Oliver Stone. George W. Bush was a classmate of yours at Yale. Now I know you made you've you've made jokes about weapons of mass destruction, but did you actually know him, cross paths with him? Did you have any kind of relationship with him when you were in Yale? The only relationship with George W. Bush, Bush was uh, we took a bath together once a week. Uh, very clean. <laughs> But uh, we have our 50th uh, graduation anniversary coming up, Yale reunion, 50th reunion. I, uh, it's, and uh, w uh, apparently Bush is going to come and do a Q&A, so uh, that's pretty cool. What? Well, no. he was in the class, so it's his 50th. Yeah. But the fact that he's uh, showing up, I, I, that's, that's, I say that good for him. That's a good thing. So you guys get uh, Trump off the ground, early 70s. Was How many perspective to your memory titles did you come up with? For, I'm sure there was Tromo wasn't the first thought you had in your mind. Do you remember any of the other names you were considering for the company? Uh, yeah, we had this really good name, but uh, it was called Netflix. We were going to incorporate under the name. Then we tried uh, Amazon, <laughs> but uh, nobody in 1974 uh, understood those words. Uh, no, the answer to the why Troma is called Troma is that uh, Michael Herz was uh, trying to find a name to incorporate in New York State that was not already taken. New York State is an old state, and probably there's a corporation called the David Camfield Corporation. Or D so every name is taken, and uh, we had to incorporate quickly because we had made a movie called Squeeze Play, which was uh, a raunchy comedy uh, themed. The theme was women's liberation, but it centered around a, uh, a women's softball team and uh, it was kind of in the t in the uh, Animal House Porky's thing, but it came out before uh, that uh, raunchy kind of comedy. And Michael wanted to, we had to get it, we wanted to distribute because we had made some movies earlier and got fucked. So we uh, thought, well, let's do it ourselves. And uh, so we had to incorporate and create a vehicle. Uh, and the worst sounding name was Troma. And Michael figured if he, if he sent the Troma name up to Albany in this, he could get that name passed because who would want that name? And indeed, it, it was uh, approved, and uh, and we figured we'd be out of business in uh, three or four months. But uh, somehow we staggered along for 44 years of disrupting media. And now Troma is kind of a brand. It's actually a, a very valuable brand, and we own about 800 movies. And the Rowan Collection, which is another 300 uh, beautifully preserved negatives, uh, Movies by Harold Lloyd and uh, movies with John Wayne and uh, uh, all sorts of stuff that's uh, public domain, but the finest, the finest uh, preprint materials, finest negatives uh, in the world. So uh, that's a very valuable. Well, Troma is doing a lot to for preservation. I know that Mr. Scorsese uh, does a lot to preserve uh, Lawrence of Arabia, but nobody's preserving some of the um, more independent and. Uh, more unique movies, and luckily the Rowan collection uh, preserves them, and we uh, own that amazing collection. Rocky came out in '76, which means that your you, trauma had already yeah, begun. Trauma had already begun when Rocky was in production. So does that mean you were juggling working on that film and running your company at the same time? Uh, I would take jobs to pay the rent, basically, and also John G. Avelson. I met him on Joe. I, my first on set for a uh, professional movie was on the set of Joe in 1970, I think. And um, the first time I stepped foot there, I saw the shot he was setting up, John Avelson. And uh, it was a beautiful shot, looking through a uh, some kind of an oven or a, uh, not an oven, what are they, a, a, a furnace. And if you get the documentary about John G. Avelson uh, called uh, King of the Underdogs, uh, I'm in it uh, much too much, but I, I, I actually, they actually showed the very shot that uh, convinced me to attach myself to John G. Avelson, which I did, and um, I, I did everything I could to help him on Joe, even though I was a toilet cleaner, and then he appreciated that, and uh, he let me uh, uh, hang out with him. In fact, he even sat through a screening of Battle of Love's Return, uh, my first movie that was shown in a movie theater. Uh, he pro we projected it in his apartment uh, 
with his poor wife. They both had to sit through it, a uh, 16 millimeter feature length movie. And um, that's the one with Oliver Stone and Lynn Lowry. Uh, and uh, it got good reviews in the Times, and but it's, uh, it's unwatchable. Um, but after that, uh, then I uh, hung out with him quite a bit and I helped him. Uh, I worked for him for free, actually, uh, a bit while he was trying to get the next gig after Joe. And then Joe became a huge hit. That was Peter Boyle and Susan Sarandon's first movie. And he got a guy named Lee Hessel to hire him to direct uh, a pulpy detective book, kind of a softcore detective story, uh, kind of a James Bond, second rate, you know, third tier James Bond kind of thing. And once again, Avelson uh, transformed it into, uh, got a great writer, David O'Dell, and did what he did to Joe, transform it from a piece of schlock to a movie that is a brilliant, brilliant satire. How did you wind up getting slung over Sylvester Stallone's shoulder in Rocky? Well, uh, that's kind of private between me and Sil <laughs> Sylvester, but uh, we were, Troma was hired to produce, basically, line produce, they call it, the Philadelphia scenes of Rocky. Uh, the Chardoff and Winkler uh, did not have enough money in their budget to shoot in the whole movie in Philadelphia. And Sylvester Stallone and John G. Avelson uh, were 100% set on the aesthetics of shooting on real locations because Rocky was to be a gritty, kind of realistic uh, Frank Capra movie shot on location. And um, and uh, nobody could do that. So um, John had the idea, let's get the trauma team to organize it secretly in Philadelphia. And I went around getting the locations, and I filmed a lot of this stuff at the time. And, um, and then uh, the crew from Cry Uncle that we had, uh, who John uh, knew, uh, it was basically his crew from Cry Uncle. We got them, or most of them, and maybe there was some Troma crew, uh, and we all went to Philadelphia, and uh, Stallone and uh, Burgess Meredith and uh, uh, whatever his name is, uh, I can't remember, uh, Spinell was in it. Uh, all these, you know, the main stars came in, and uh, we shot about eight days there, the, the steps, running up the steps of the museum, the uh, meat packing where Rocky is hitting the uh, meat with a b baseball bat or a golf club or whatever he did. Uh, oh no, he punched the meat. He punched. I think we used that joke with every other. Ath yeah, we used that. With, we did it with baseball bats and squeeze play, but uh, he did it with. You know, he was punching the meat, and uh, all those iconic scenes: the pet store, uh, the fruit market, running through the fruit market. The first use, or the, uh, actually the second use in history of the Steadicam. Uh, uh, I was the, uh, basically the production manager, line producer for all that stuff. But since it was all union, uh, we had to kind of keep a low profile. Who tapped you on the shoulder and said, we need you to be this drunken bum? Uh, that was I, who uh, was the... Uh, it was, uh, we were shooting uh, in Philadelphia, and I told Avelson, uh, I want to play a part. So he gave me, since I've known for uh, consuming a, a great deal of uh, non, you know, medicine, <laughs> alcoholic, uh, what do you call it? Uh, how do you say it when you're uh, taking uh, medicine, uh, 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 booze or self-medicating? Yes. Uh, in those days, uh, in fact, John G. Allison was pretty, he taught me quite a bit about self-medication. So um, uh, he let me play that part and Stallone slung me over his shoulder. And I remember at the time, I, I, you know, I had no money and I was, I was wearing a pair of blue jeans that had a huge rip right in the crotch so you could see my underpants. And uh, I think that might have attracted Stallone, but uh, Avelson was shocked. I remember he was really turned off when, uh, you know, I think we did it twice, so that, or we did it, what, whatever we did, we had to redo it and uh, kind of hide my uh, disgusting uh, underpants. Yeah, and junk. Now, so now here's the other thing. In Philadelphia, the scene in which I was put over, uh, that Sylvester picked me up out of the gutter and slings me over his shoulder and carries me into the bar, from the exterior gutter into the bar, that interior of the bar was not Philadelphia. The interior of the bar was in Los Angeles. So, uh, being a, a ham, um, I paid my own way to go to Philadelphia, to go to Los Angeles, and continue the scene. We got stopped, and the Teamsters caught up with us on the, around the eighth or ninth day, and um, we, uh, the team, uh, the Rocky gang, all went back to uh, Los Angeles. Uh, I stayed in New York. And by the way, Michael Hers and his beautiful wife Maris at, were syncing up the dailies. We would shoot in Philadelphia and the uh, film would go to TVC 
laboratories, uh, and the sound would go to Magno Sound, and the uh, so you had to sync up the sound and the uh, picture called dailies, and then send them back to L.A. to be run on a double a double uh, double track uh, projector in the uh, auditor in the uh, in a conference room at the Philadelphia Hilton where we were all staying. And um, uh, I had to operate the projector, which uh, was very stressful because the 35 millimeter breaks, and uh, uh, and also I just had to learn how to, uh, you know, when you, when you, it's your first job, kind of, and you got uh, all these people that are fairly high up there, like Chodoff and Winkler, and uh, waiting to screen the dailies, and I'm the one doing it. Uh, it's uh, very, very stressful. At any rate, uh, Michael and Maris were syncing up the dailies, and they were hearing. Uh, in our editing room back in New York, uh, you do what are you doing? The podcast of they're like, what the fuck is this? Uh, but my mother-in-law, my mother-in-law had read the script uh, months before the movie was made. She said it would be a huge hit. She said it would be the next Marty, which was a underground, not underground. It was an independent. It yeah. was a, a low Best budget, winner, yeah. huge, uh, a huge success, and she was right. It, uh, Daniel Mann's. Uh, 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 Marty is. I'm glad you remember that, but most people don't. But um, uh, Rocky obviously became one of the iconic movies. And my home movies, my home movies are. Uh, Avelson cut them down to about ten minutes last year, and they are on the um, the b- latest box set of uh, of uh, Rocky. Uh, this box set with the, all the Rocky iterations in one box. The Blu-ray, Blu-rays. Rest in peace, John Avelson. Now, with uh, Stallone, you're working with him pretty regularly. Did the thought occur to you to try to recruit him for a trauma film? Uh, no, he was way beyond. Uh, he was uh, way beyond trauma at the time because he had already been in uh, Death Race. Yeah, and he had been in uh, another one that was actually uh, kind of a L- Lords uh, of Flatbush. Yeah, Lords of Flatbush, exactly. And um, so I don't think he was too interested in. Also, they were they hadn't shot art. Right? This was. We shot this before they shot in L.A., all the stuff in Philadelphia. And uh, and we used the Steadicam for the first time, and I did uh, home movies of that. And Avelson cut them to, he cut uh, cut them down to 10 minutes, and then he and I wrote commentary track. And it's quite amusing, as well as very, if anybody's interested in making movies, uh, you can find this uh, Lloyd Kaufman's home movies. It's either on Troma Movies on YouTube for free, and then I think Avelson also put them up on uh, on YouTube uh, for free, obviously. And then they're in the uh, in the in the Fox Fox's uh, box set of the of the uh, Blu-rays. But you can get them on the Troma Troma movies on YouTube for free. I think it's Lloyd Kaufman's home movies or Rocky home movies or something like that. It's quite they're quite amusing and very very educational because you'll see that all these great scenes that were shot in Rocky. All these great scenes were done the trauma way. The director is strapped to the front of a of a of a vehicle, a car, and Stallone is driving the car, and uh, that's how we shoot driving scenes in Tromaville. It puts, you know, we shoot uh, with the director strapped to the car, roped up on on the hood of the car, and the actor drives his own car. And they do not do that in a in a real movie. They would never have the actor and the director in uh, such a uh, of a, uh, a trauma, trauma style uh, way these days. They would never do that. You know, this podcast is only a half hour, and to interview Lloyd for a half hour is impossible. So make sure to tune in next month for the conclusion of my interview with Lloyd Kaufman. Thank you so much for listening. The Trauma Now podcast is produced by Lloyd Kaufman, Michael Harris, and Levi White. Music by Rick Batari and Jerry Harm. Creative consultants Timmy Packer and PJ Griffin. If you'd like to follow Troma on Twitter, visit twitter.com slash Troma underscore team. Or you can follow me at Twitter at twitter.com slash Dave Campfield, all one word.